Good morning, everyone. <laughs> it's still early for me. Um, I managed to get up at, at uh, half past five, almost. That's very early. I'm still not awake. I won't be for another 45 minutes. But anyway. Um, okay. Uh, I've been asked to talk a little bit about myself. My name is Roger. I live in Landskrona. I am 46 years old. Hard to believe, isn't it? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, a small comfort is that Jürgen has the same age. Thank no you. Way. Thank you for that. <laughs> uh, anyway. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. I, uh, my, my course among computers started at the age about between 10 or 12. So with, what did I do? Uh, I went to my parents. I said, I want a computer. Okay, what's that? They said. Well, I tried to explain it. And my, some of my friends had, had computers. There were Commodore VIC-64, VIC-20, VIC and you all know about those. So what did my mother do? Uh, she wasn't very well educated and, and she feared this in, in a way. So she went to the, to the bookshelf and she picked a rather large book, which is some kind of self-study in mathematics. She picked up the most advanced thing she could find in the book. That was like, I don't know, graphs or diagrams. And, and she pointed at it and she said, when you know this, we can get you a computer. Well, thank you. <laughs> that will take some time. Uh, anyway, an hour later, I got my first computer. And that was a, a, a Spectra Video Express 16. Of course, no hard drive. I bought it from a five and a quarter disc. Um, I could mimic the sounds it made when it booted. Um, yeah, that's where it started. At that time, it, there wasn't any games really for PCs. This was a, an XT, 8088 processor at, at ravishing 4.57 megahertz. Um, so what, what did I do? Because I was interested in electronics and all that. I bought some, some LEDs and I put it in, in the parallel port. And I started to, to disassemble uh, something. Uh, and, and I, I made a, a small program with running lights in the parallel port. No games, but from there on it, it continued. So most of my assignments has been around hardware and, and very low level stuff. I used to say, I, I don't know Java. Um, I can read it and understand quite a lot because it's very similar to C++. Which I have been given lessons at Malmö University for, yeah, oh gosh, it's 17 years ago. Um, well, uh, my interests are obviously sailing. We have a sailing boat, um, which is nine and a half meters long and 3.20 meters wide. This is the harbor of. Rungsted in Denmark at night. I've taken the picture myself. <clears throat> so this is my desktop. When I try to escape in my mind, I put up that picture. So that's nice. Um, other interest is music, like Jonathan. Uh, I sing in a choir. I've been singing in, in a choir since I was seven. So that's 40 years, almost. Um, I also play the electric organ as my main instrument. I've been cheating um, with other things so like trumpet, the harmonica and, and yeah, stuff like that. Um, yeah. I live with my, it's not wife, but she might be someday. Um, and our, our daughter, that is five years old, 
and my bonus daughter, which is 17. Um, we have a, a house there, and uh, the house is quite old. It's 90 years old, so it's, it, it, it needs some kind of attention every now and then. Uh, so right now, uh, I've been renovating the windows for the last four or five years, I think. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's fun, it's very practical in comparison to, to our work, which is quite abstract sometimes. Um, so it's nice. Well... Is your boat also in Lanskrona? Is there a harbour? Yes, there is a harbour in Lanskrona. There's actually three harbours in Lanskrona for, for small boats. So. And our harbour is called Borstahusen. It's on the north side. Yeah. Education-wise, I'm actually self-taught. Uh, I'm like I said, I, I began in, in early early ages uh, and uh, tried to teach myself. I was interested. I was interested in mathematics. Um, so it, it all came to pieces when when I, I came to the the upper secondary school. Then it all. It all made sense in a way. So uh, I managed to learn quite a few languages. Like uh, I started out with small assembly uh, and went on to, to basic and, and Pascal, Modula 2, uh, C, C, Python. Yeah. And it also depends on what you call a language. In a while, we were talking about Orc that can also be considered a language. Uh, I've seen examples of people creating the Pong game in Orc. And that's, that's just absurd. Anyway. What's Orc? Orc. Yeah, what is it? I've never heard of it. No, we'll get into it. Oh, okay. Um, actually, we can get into it right now. I'll just start up the... Um, No. <laughs> of course. Uh, my current assignment is at Fingerprint Cards in the Western Harbour here in Melbourne. Uh, working very closely to the, uh, the hardware. Um, I've been at quite a few places. Um, I've been in, in the, the printing business, printing lottery tickets. Uh, I've been working for both force military equipment, we made sea mines. Uh, there we, are. we have a really embedded system, a small microprocessor controlling the entire minefield. Uh, the RAM memory was 902 bytes. That's, that's a challenge, I can say. Um, so I, after that, I, I became a consultant and I began at Sigma. Uh, it changed name a couple of times. It uh, went on to Teleka and Teleka uh, Exelon and software, but yeah. And after that, I came to PurpleScan. So, in just a couple of months, I've been here 10 years. Um, and I had lots, uh, lots of assignments during the time as well. Um, of course, I've been where everybody else has been. I've also been to Axis, and I've been to Haldex, I've been to uh, Anuta. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Now, I will talk about Orc. Of course. I thought it said Orc, like as in Lord of the Rings Orcs. Yeah. That's why I didn't get it. Yeah. <laughs> Hard to play around with those. <laughs> Orc. And this is supposed to be an easy to digest introduction. That means that I'm not trying to teach you all the features of Orc. My aim or what I'm trying to do is, is introduce you to the tool called Orc. It's a magnificent tool um, and 
hopefully you'll be aware of what it might be able to do so you won't hesitate to try to use it. Now, Orc is almost as old as I am. Uh, almost quoting Bilbo the Hobbit. Um, <clears throat> it, uh, it appeared in 1977, so he's 40 years old. And he's named after its creators. Aho, Weinberger and Kernigan is not short for awkward. Even though it can be considered quite awkward by some. When do you use orc? Every time you have data that can be considered to be ordered in, in columns and rows, and much is, just depends on how you define those columns and rows. Rows, um, for using the, the orc term, terminology, they are, they are called records, and the columns are called fields. This is quite common in other languages as well. Um, rows are typically separated by new line and columns by white space, one or several. Now this can be changed <clears throat> because those delimiters and separators, they can be as aggressive as regular expressions. Imagine that. So you can define exactly how you pass your data. Just uh, depends on your power of your imagination. How to invoke orc? Well, command line. After all, I am a command line freak um, and very much in, in Linux. Um, in in uh, my current assignment, I, I uh, one of the tasks is to uh, to write drivers for Linux, and uh, I always work at the command line interface. Uh, my main editor of choice is Vim. So yeah, I mean, it's not very healthy, I I can imagine, but anyway. <laughs> Well, how to invoke org from command line. You can have an input, the data to be passed as an input file. Or it can be piped on standard in. Um, and the latter is, is most common because that's very easy. If you have output from another process and you want to, to extract data from it, and, and sort it and do whatever you want to do with it in order to present exactly what you think is necessary from the input. So the latter is more common in my opinion. The structure of an org script or one line line for that matter is like this. Org is obviously the name of the tool and you, you pass it a string, which can also be a, a script, so, uh, like a, an, uh, a file. You have optional uh, parts of it. The begin part, the, which is executed before any of the input is being passed. There you can set up things. You can assign uh, regular expressions for, for the, the separators, for instance. You can also uh, initialize uh, variables and, and if you need them. Otherwise, you define variables just like that. And they're, they're always assigned to, uh, to uh, nothing or null or something like that. Then you have the most common part in the middle. Uh, that part is executed for every record in the input. There you can uh, separate things, you can uh, print column 5 or the last column, or you can, uh, you also have uh, 
printf, so you can you can format your output exactly how you want to do it. And we're going to get into how that works. Last, there is the end block, which is executed after all the input has been passed. Um, yeah. There you can uh, summarize things. You can. Um, it might be that the, the part in the middle doesn't really provide any output. It just creates a, a big array or, or something that you want to um, display at the end. Like sorting, for instance. So, what does it look like? Here we have two examples. For each record, print field number four. It's as easy as this. The string inside the uh, apostrophe is what is to be executed for every record. It just simply says print dollar sign four. Note the similarity of the dollar sign in, in using a variable in shell. It's the same thing. <coughs> Now, for each record containing the string purple, print the last field. And you do a search for purple, string search. The syntax is like that. It's a slash, and you write the string, and, it's, and an end slash. And you provide the, uh, what's, what's to be executed if the string matches. And it prints the last field. There, here we use a variable called nf, which stands for number of fields. It's the number of fields for every record, or rather for the current record. So it might be that you lack two columns in one record. It doesn't really matter because nf will be set to, to two less than the previous one. So it's for every current record. <clears throat> I'm sorry about that. Here we have an example file. It's rather corny, but I think it will, uh, will show you uh, the principle of it. It's an ordinary text file with company names and their employees in Europe and globally in three fields, separated by tabs. Uh, on the left side, this is how it looks when you look at it uh, on Simple Editor, and on the, on the right side, I've put in where the tabs are located. So, if we write, write a small orc one liner that says print column one. It generates the following result. Why? Well, it's by default, orc will use a single white space as a delimiter, <clears throat> or several, as you can see to the lower right. Um, that's a regular expression saying how uh, the field separator looks like by default. So it finds <clears throat> it finds uh, the white spaces in the first field and interprets that as a field separator. That was not our intention. How do we do it right? Well we can tell orc that the field separator is a tab sign by using the switch F, large F, capital. <clears throat> now it works. Now it provides the expected output, even though there are white spaces inside uh, the first column or field. The F switch assigns the internal field separator called fs, it's a variable name, like comparable to nf, to the expression uh, following the switch. You can also, of course, uh, assign 
uh, strings and, and uh, regular expressions to the internal FS variable, just with, the, with an equal sign. Um, most likely in the begin block, but you can also change it on the fly. That one, you mean? Yes, yeah, so it's an alternative way of writing the same thing. Yes, it provides the same result. It does the same thing, basically. Yeah. It's just two different ways of doing the same thing. Either by uh, the first option is a command line switch, and the other one is inside the script, so to speak. I mean, the difference is that if you have a script, you can omit how, uh, what field separator should be used. Yeah. And you can provide that on command line using the first option. Yeah. On the other hand, you may really want and, and desire uh, that this should be the field separator. <laughs> the script is based on that and based oh, on yeah. for a certain input. So I always use the first uh, Yeah. Okay, that's good. It means that somebody learned something new. <laughs> so, <clears throat> examples of working with it with the, um, the input file. Here we can list companies with less than 10 employees in Europe, still using the type sign as field separator. And, and the, the condition is simply, if field number two is less than 10. And I provide the, the, the name of the file, uh, input file, which is called companies. Why does it work? Well, because default action is to print the whole record. So I don't have to explicitly say print dollar zero. Dollar zero is the complete record. The other example is list number of employees outside Europe. And now we're doing some arithmetics on, on the, uh, the input data. So we say print the first field, which is the name of the company, and then we subtract field number two from field number three and print that, separated by the output field separator, which is a variable named OFS. That can also be changed, of course. So you can set it to, to uh, the OFS, could be a tab sign as well. It provides a nicer output, actually. So if your ABK script is a conditional, it defaults to printing the, fir the first column or the whole row? The whole row. The whole row, okay. So like li list companies with less than 10 employees, it's actually list the row. Yeah. Okay, yes. and, and another question is that you use double quotes. It, you have to use double quotes always for like string. Uh, it's a shell thing. Yeah. You, you cannot use single. Yeah. Okay. Um, if I w if I've used uh, if I didn't use uh, double quotes there, it will interpret it as backslash t. It wouldn't expand the, the, to the type yeah, sign. It's to escape, yeah. So it's a shell thing. Yeah. It's not an orc thing. You can use C in quote as well. Okay. And, and, oh. and is those like, is the, are those back ticks? Tick ticks? What do you call them? Or are those single quotes? Uh, single quotes. Sing, okay. Okay, thanks. Hmm? And, oh, and another one. It seems <coughs> like you write the uh, double quote after the capital F without yes. the space in between. Yes. Is, is that like uh, something you can do for all? things like in the whole terminal or is this something you can do in ABK? Because I always put a space between sort of like the key and the value. It, it depends on the tool. Okay, but so if, okay. if you use, if the tool is built with the standard thing and how to do this, you can use both. You can have a space and you can omit the space. doesn't really matter.
there, there is some kind of small framework for how to uh, interpret and, and pass command line options. So yeah. that it takes care of that. Right. Which is v way uh, apart from, from walk. Anyway, more examples on, on the example file. <clears throat> Here we can summarize employees for companies named horse or cow. So what? Now it becomes bigger. What does it do? Still using the tab sign as field separator, we search, string search in column number one, field one, for horse or cow. Uh, horse or cow must be somewhere on the line or in that field. Doesn't have to be the complete field, but it must be there. If there's a match, add field number three to the variable called tot, short for total. It doesn't provide any output, but there's an end block which prints total, colon, and the sum of it all. And, of course, the input file name. No. Oh, okay. No. It doesn't. It's very clever. You can you can add strings, concatenate them, and all that. It's, it's like it's magic, like Python or something. <laughs> <laughs> it works. It doesn't crash. Gonna. And as I've written it here, it is case sensitive. Okay, cool. they, it can be case insensitive. They, I won't get into that. Right. But. And the uh, follow up on that if I were to put a uh, uh, space between uh, the, the opening parenthesis and the H, would it interpret that as space, space horse? Yes. <laughs> it's a space horse. Oh, yeah. yes. 16 legs, actually. <laughs> yes, it will take the space into account. Yes. So does that mean it has its own uh, sort of dialect of regex? No, it's POSIX compatible. Okay. Why would you have to denote the regex in, like, okay, never mind, continue. Uh, yeah, and the other example is is how you you, uh, you set a condition on which records to print, you know, when to start and when to stop, and and you can write any condition. In this case, I have. I start the, the output when field number one uh, contains the word cat. And I stop when field number one contains the word white. And print the whole record. And this, this can be, the, the conditions are separated by, uh, by comma sign. And that could be anything that evaluates the true or false. So you can put, you can put, uh, if I use my mouse, you can put, uh, now, in here, here, on the left side of the comma sign, you can put one. Then it will start from the beginning. Or, or on, on the right side of the comma sign, you can set zero then it never stops. You can use the uh, number of records variable and just count rows. The, the number of records variable is comparable to number of fields. So it's NF and NR. So how do you denote the difference between row one and column one? So is it the presence of a dollar sign in front of it? So dollar one is column one. 
Yes. And how do you know that row one? Then I would write uh, uh, dollar nr equals one. For NR contains the number of records passed up to this point. Yeah. yeah. Programming in ORC, <clears throat> well, you have all the, the, the keywords you're used to. If else, while, for, switch, break, continue, next. We have a C style printf. We have associative arrays even called maps or got many names file operations you can open files and, and close read and write from inside the org script besides the input data itself and much more just like Jonathan said just google it so as a programmer you should feel right at home some real world examples what process uses the local port 10777? We, uh, we provide the output of netstat. And the switch is there, means that it will, will write all the TCP and UDP ports, um, <clears throat> and even, uh, even listening ports, and provide it with a list. We pass that list with this org script. And it simply says, if field number four contains colon 10777, end of word, it will print the whole record. So that's very easy. Um, let me show you. Um, I, I could see that in, in, in the eyes of some of you that that was very very strange. Can you increase the size? Of the I will. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> <laughs> Number four contains. That should be it. What did I do now? Uh, yeah, of course. Okay. We have, um, okay. I forgot to, um, actually, actually it's Skype that uses that port, but I forgot to start it, so that's why it didn't provide any output. No, there it is. If I didn't use the um, the uh, the orc part, it would provide this output, which can be quite tedious to to uh, sort out manually. So again, and I will hopefully this works. I lo I've lost the mouse. It's there. The top right. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> Now, uh, appearance, well, move it up like, can we have 20? Ooh. Oh, it's terrible. Anyway, it, you should be able to see that uh, even at the back of, of, uh, so, there it is. Of course, it, it works. The, the first two lines we're seeing because they're not part of the standard output. Exactly. 
exactly. Those are printed on standard error. So if I do, if I if I pipe standard error to the, yeah, there's it's a good point, Tim. Good point. If I do like that, we will lose those two lines. Yeah. And now I've, I've asked uh, what is using port number 53. Well, it, it seems like uh, dash. <laughs> no, that's not that's not true. This is because I'm not I'm not running netstat as the root user. This uh, port number 53 is for DNS, so it's a DNS mask process. Anyway. Um, next example is list modified files in a Git repo, excluding, for instance, linker script and MK files. Now this, uh, I realize now that it can be hard to read. Anyway, it's a, it, it's an ordinary Git status minus UNO for not listing. Uh, untracked files. We provide it with an org script that search for the word modified in the first column and when it finds that word it starts to process the input and it stops when it finds the first blank line. And if field number two does not contain .ld or mk prints field number two, which is the file name. Quite easy to, to, to pipe to xargs and git add, for instance, so you can stage your modified files, but just a subset of them. The last example on that slide is truncating the output from any process to the screen width. Here we use the printf and the type specified the, the uh, percentage sign dot and then I use the shell variable. You see there's a, there's a single quote sign there, so I'm, I'm this is not part of the uh, the string. I use the shell variable columns and I continue with the awk script string and print a new line and the whole record. It means that the lines from the output, I, I piped through awk in this case, it will not wrap at line uh, on the right side of the screen or the terminal window. This can be a nice thing, at least I think so. Some logs, or if, if I use tail and, and follow the log, it, it might wrap on the other. Then it, it's very hard to read, especially if you're looking for something. Yes? So the. Oh, maybe you should. Oh, sorry about that. So, like the second one? Yes. Uh, so, is, the, is it basically the syntax is that you define. Um, zero or two, up to two conditionals, indicating from where to where. Yes. The rows. Yes. It's your row filter basically. It's like a, a boolean on each side of the comma sign. Yeah, exactly. But you can also provide one, and then it sort of matches all, all the rows that matches that one. And if you provide two, it matches until the second one, from the first one. Until no, the I have to provide a condition yeah, that exactly. evaluates to yeah. true or false. If, if I want to work with rows, I would say if dollar sign nr equals 1, for instance, uh -huh. I put that on the left side of the comma sign. Yeah. On the right side, I could say the same thing yeah. as dollar sign nr equals 10. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It will print the lines 1 to 10. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but the, so basically, those, the, you start with your conditional sort of row selector. Yes. Yes. And then after that, you always have this curly braces, which basically executes per row. Yeah, yeah. It's so like an it's control. like an if condition, and then you have the block. Yeah. You can have several blocks. You can have uh, multiple blocks that pr operates on the same input. Oh, 
blocks and you don't you're not confined to one block. No. You can just and each block yes. will be executed for per row. But they will be executed from left to right. Yeah, yeah. Which means that if you have if you have a block um, that says next then the rest of the script won't be passed. It will continue to the next record. Mm. That's very useful in, in yeah, yeah, yeah. some situations. Right. <clears throat> so this is actually my last slide. I will provide you with tip of the day. Unique output. Sometimes you have logs or, or similar things that provides the same thing over and over again. You, you can have thousands of prints that prints the same thing. And, and the output will become flooded with things. That, so it's very hard to find what you're looking for. It might even be that you, you don't know what you're looking for. So I find myself in a situation where I want to only print a line once even if it reoccurs. We have the tool called Unique. Well, it's rather, rather insufficient because Unique, it requires the input data to be sorted. The matching lines must be adjacent. Otherwise, it will print out the whole input. Now, we can use awk for this. The script inside, what does it do? It, it's simply a condition that says if this line has not been seen before, print it. Seen is a variable, is an associative array. The key is the complete row with text and it contains an integer that is increased every time the, that particular row is encountered in the input data. So when it's zero the line gets printed. After that line is printed the integer, the corresponding integer in the map is not zero anymore. So the next time it won't be printed. Again, the default action is to print the whole record. Of course, you don't have to use the complete row. You can use a field or a number of fields. But you can build it up as you would like. Quite neat. Yeah. End of lesson. Thank you. It depends on your regular expressions. <laughs> now, uh, actually, I don't know. I suppose it does. Not even if you install Sigwin on Windows. Sigwin works, uh, works fine. There's an orc in, in the Sigwin. Oh, speaking of that, I, I forgot to say, I'm sorry. Um, Orc comes in different flavors. There is the original Orc, is in some forums called the O Orc for original. There's the GNU Orc called Gork, and there is uh, some new ones called Mork or Nork. Mohawk. Yeah, <laughs> Mohawk. Yeah, no, no. Um, <clears throat> all the examples. Uh, that I've written here, they work with all flavors of Orc. Uh, the differences comes in when we have uh, features such as substring matching. We have uh, functions for that, we, like submatch. There's a function called submatch, and all that. They differ in 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 how their output is provided. I think it's GNU Orc that provides an array which the other flavors doesn't do. And yeah. 
When you get to the advanced stuff, they differ in small parts. So just be careful. Uh, can you nest uh, conditions or are, yes. are they yeah. always uh, separated by commas? No, you can nest them as in any language, so like Java, C, and Python, yeah. Absolutely. Why does it have this awkward nickname? What's awkward about it? Yeah. It's it's awkward came from awk. Sorry. <laughs> 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 yeah, that could be it actually. <laughs> yeah. And this got bundled in the shell or in the. Yes. It's part of GNU and Utils, right? Yeah. So it should yeah. be in Mac OS. Should be in any shell that you encounter, like Sigwin, for instance. It, it should be there. If it, if it's not, it is a standard tool. It's easy to install. Mm. Just a matter of package. Might be that Sigwin has as a um, an orc package or several, but one for one every flavor and yeah. But it's it's there. Is that all? Does anybody have a last question? Right. <laughs> That's very true. Thank you. Thank you. Thank yep. you, Jonathan. Thank you.